Uh, this is Upload Bookseller um, and we're on Foss Lane in Bath which is a fairly ancient trackway. We're close to Roman Road in Bath Easton and we're right so we're sort of on the edge of North East Somerset and bordering South Gloucestershire and Wiltshire are both very very close here indeed. Weird of course is an old English word maybe Anglo-Saxon um, meaning fate Today I want to talk about the careers of two writers who are tangential to folk horror. One of them you could say would be possibly pure folk horror. He's not around anymore sadly to discuss this and that's Robert Holdstock, winner of the World Fantasy Award for Mythaga Wood. The other one is Brian Bates who is still around who's a um, psychologist um, historian he wrote a book called The Way of Weird both of these books came out in the mid 80s and were very successful particularly the whole stock and I want to talk about them today and their connections to folk horror. As you can see it's a very sunny January day here in Somerset, England and you, know, you think is this appropriate for folk horror? Well you know if you watch things like The Wicker Man we could be on Summer Isle or Midsummer, which I admit I'm not so keen on but yeah I think we can get away with it. Folk horror is so much about the celebration of nature, the power of nature, the eternal recurrence of the cycle through the year death and rebirth, the seasons, spring, summer, autumn, winter and I thought why not? Something that was important in the work of Holdstock was the concept of thinning, of the places where the barriers between our world, the real world, the rational world and other worlds broke down and things came through. This is key to Ryope Wood, the forest which features in his Mythaga Wood cycle. Ryope Wood is a fictional wood in Herefordshire and the novel starts at the end of World War II where two brothers were estranged from their father who's been a distant figure all their lives. He's been obsessed with research in this wood and they can recall a moment when a man called Alfred Watkins came to the house, the author of a book called The Old Straight Track. This is a real book and The Old Straight Track was the second book by that author and it was the book that established the concept of ley lines. The two brothers have different experiences during the war and when they return to their cottage on the edge of Riot Wood. At different stages they both discover their father's researches. Riot Wood is a thin place, it's a kind of time vortex and inside that wood the avatars of famous folk characters from our mythology, from Robin Hood, King Arthur, earlier ones, they form out of the Jungian collective unconscious of the observers and the spirit of the wood itself and it's a very spooky novel, a very strange novel and some say you know it's a fantasy novel written by a science fiction writer because Holdstock had written three science fiction novels before that, I Among the Blind, Earth Wind and Where Time Winds Blow published by Faber. Ursula Le Gan was a particular fan of these and interestingly 
they often go into strange juxtapositions like archaeological digs on alien planets which some have connections to Anglo-Saxon burials and the like. They're not entirely successful books but they are worth the read. These are in the sort of early to mid 70s. Holdstock wrote under a number of pseudonyms as well in the late 70s. He wrote tie-ins, horror tie-ins for films under the name Robert Black including Legend of the Werewolf, the Tyburn film, The Satanists, As Chris Carson he wrote a Sword and Sorcery trilogy called Berserker and he also wrote a series with Angus Wells as well. I've not read any of these and um, I didn't become aware of them until I was familiar with his other work and you know he when he won Mythalga Wood won the um, World Fantasy Award I think it was 1983 I started looking at his other work in a bit more depth and you know it's good stuff and he was um, he studied zoology tropical medicine and that's what he was a specialist in but he became a professional writer pretty early in his writing career and Mythago was the book that really pushed him into the big league I met him a few times I met him at the World Con in 87 talked to him there and I talked to him on the phone a little while after that Want to get him to Bath to do an event in the bookshop I was working in and this is when the sequel to Mythago Wood, Lavondis, came out and he said to me you're the first person who's pronounced the title correctly but that's because you're Welsh so I was very pleased with that. The last time I met Rob was in London in 2006 at a friends and family showing of The Prestige, the film by Christopher Nolan based on the novel by my friend Christopher Priest and Priest and Holstock have known each other since the 70s they've both been signed to Faber and Pan for paperbacks they edited an anthology together Stars of Albion and they were you know they were good chums I remember being in the pub in London before we went to see the film in Leicester Square the Odeon there with Chris and Rob and I was kind of overawed even though I'd known Chris for years and I met Rob before I thought wow I'm here with two World Fantasy Award winners it was really quite something because um, Chris won the World Fantasy Award for the prestige um, the World Fantasy Award of course is very broad it means fantasy in the widest sense novels publishers mainstream novels have won it like Perfume by Patrick Suskind In the early 80s under the name Robert Falcon Holdstock wrote a six volume series called Night Hunter which are a kind of Dennis Wheatley folk horror about a family man whose wife and children are abducted by a group of occultists and they're quite good they're very hard to get hold of now and um, there are a couple of omnibus editions they were hardcovers they were paperbacks and it's very very hard to find a complete set I used to have some of them and I foolishly got rid of them which wasn't really a good idea I get the feeling they were never all issued in the same livery in the same format I've never seen a complete set and at various times some were out of print some were in print and I think at some point I've got to try and reacquire them but they're very hard to find especially in good neck and Holstock is very very collectible but the Night Hunter series I'll put some pictures of the covers and the tiles up on the screen are really good if you like folk horror he um, often stepped over the line I mean Mythago Wood is a pretty scary book I ally it to Sword and Sorcery but it doesn't really have any of that stuff in it even though it has figures avatars archetypes of the kind you would find in a Sword and Sorcery novel and he was very much into that Celtic and Dark Ages thing and he retreated deeper and deeper into that rabbit hole 
And after Lavondis, I kind of got off because at that stage, I didn't want too much of that sort of thing. I was more into my sort of contemporary SF, which was very exciting at that point in the um, late 80s. But recently I've returned to looking at his work and I read a book called The Fetch recently. The beginnings of his books are often quite clunky and stodgy and have poor syntax, but when he's at his best, he really fired on all cylinders. The Fetch is about a man and woman who adopt a child, a child from a mysterious background. And the child seems to have this uncanny ability to bring objects from different points in time. And um, it's a story about greed and a story about not fitting in. And it's, quite, it's got some really scary moments. So if you're a folk horror fan, if you can get hold of The Fetch, I'd really recommend it. It's not his best written book, but it is probably the closest to true folk horror apart from the Robert Falcon ones. Here we are in the pristine quiet of the English countryside with a chainsaw in the background. It's obviously, um, you know, the um, Bathhampton Chainsaw Massacre and not a folk horror thing, as you know. But it just shows you how, how hard it would be to have irrational beliefs and have a cult and actually do anything nefarious in the country these days. If you know, if you wanted to do a wicker man type thing, you know, you'd have real problems because there's people everywhere. You'd never get away with it. As it was so noisy where I went to shoot the parts of this video by Robert Holdstock, I was going to talk about Brian Bates outside as well, but there were people sort of using chainsaws in the background and that sort of thing. And I went into the churchyard to um, talk about Jack the Ripper and Walter Sickett. So I might put those things as a blooper sort of at the end of this video, but I decided to come up because it was cold and you know the quiet of the English countryside was actually the noise of the English countryside. So just to resume from where we were. So here are a few more Robert Holdstock books to watch out for. I just thought I'd show you my, this is my world first edition of Mythago Word. And um, I never got around to getting to sign this for me, um, probably because it wasn't the right place, right time. And this one sort of bound, was rebound in kind of a faux leather, a bit like Skivatex. And I bought this in Hay on Y in about 1985. If you look at my channel, there's a video about Hay on Y, and I do go and do some science fiction and fantasy book shopping there. Um, so that's the first edition, very collectible book these days. Um, and there were several books in the Rye Hope Wood sequence. And shortly before Rob Holsock died, is about, literally about three or four months, um, he finished the sequence with this Avalon, which is described as a direct sequel to Mythog World. I've not actually read this yet. Um, this is now print on demand. It's quite expensive, so it's $16.99. But, um, you know, that's one to watch out for as well. It's a beautiful cover, I think. And something else I picked up recently, because I do these videos, you get enthused about these writers again, is um, The Ragthorn, um, a book by Robert Holstock and Gary Kilworth. And Gary Kilworth interesting science fiction, fantasy, horror writer, children's writer, historical fiction writer. Um, and they knew each other. They were both published by Faber at the same time, both friendly with Christopher Priest. And they were kind of like stable mates, really. And um, I'm looking forward to reading that. I got that a while ago, a little novella. And um, this looks very, very spooky indeed. Um, yeah, looking forward to that. That'll be a good one. And um, so they're both great little writers. And um, I say this is The Fetch. Um, which I showed you earlier on, very sort of handsome, but with a Jim Burns jacket. Jim Burns, wonderful science fiction and fantasy illustrator, the finest ever, in my opinion. Great wraparound jacket. And I said, this is probably the most folk horror-y one, aside from Mythago um, and the Robert Falk and the um, Night, Night Hunter novels. So that's worth looking out for. Quite a rare and collectible book. I picked this up a few years ago for about £15. You will pay up to 50 quid for it, sometimes more. So, but worth looking out for. And just want to mention quickly a writer who's tangential to um, Holdstock, who's Keith Roberts. Keith Roberts, the Thomas Hardy of English science fiction. And he wrote a lot of things which are very, very steeped in the British countryside. And they're not exactly folk horror, but if you're interested in the old places of Britain, um, very, very, very great stuff, very beautifully written. And he's yet to be discovered by the mainstream. He was a very difficult man. Um, and this is a little chat book he did, Irish Encounters, a little travel book published by a small press called Kerosina. And I'm going to be doing something about Keith at some point because he really wrote about the West Country 
particularly in a really amazing way. And he's a fantastic writer at all levels. He had praise in people like Anthony Burgess. Um, he's generally regarded as, as a genius, but he's a very, very difficult man to deal with personally, apparently. So, um, and just to say, if you're coming over to Britain or if you live in Britain um, and you can get to the south and walk around, it's a little fanzine that's worth watching out for. I got this from Magalleria in Bath, um, really fantastic um, magazine shop. Magalleria is an Italian word, meaning news agent or magazine shop. And um, this is Weird Walk, which is very witty, really well written. Um, it's small. There's been about five issues so far. They've got their own website. And it's just about psychogeography, hauntology, um, folk horror. Um, really, really great little um, little scene and really great fun. And it doesn't take itself too seriously. Um, you know, it's, but it's really beautifully done. So watch out for Weird Walk, a little plug for them. Because it's, it's really, really nice um, little scene, that. So get get hold of that and, um, and you'll enjoy it. It's really great fun. I was always fascinated when reading more Cox. Elric books where there's a part where Elric talks about pursuing his weird and I always thought that was great and I didn't realise that it meant fate but I had a kind of inkling that it meant something like that but I love the idea of pursuing my weird which leads me on nicely to a little discussion of um, a writer called Brian Bates um, and this is a shop called Weird in Bath and this is the way of weird and this is not the original. I do want to try and get a first edition. I used to have that years ago and um, let it go. I had a paperback. I need the first in hardcover, really. And um, this has um, a quotation from Nicolas Cage from the ill-fated remake of The Wicker Man um, on the cover, which is a modern masterpiece. And it's a real cult book. And um, I'll just read what it says in the back for you. Um, Time Out said, and I remember this quote vividly, that it reads like a fusion of Carlos Castaneda and Tolkien. If you know who Castaneda was, he was sort of a Mexican academic who um, did research into the Yaqui Indians who were heavy users of peyote and jimson weed and um, what have you. And he wrote, I think about eight books altogether. I read the first seven. And if you've ever seen the film Altered States, based on the novel by Paddy Chayefsky, which is a kind of psychedelic shamanistic um, SF movie, um, Castaneda sort of very sort of prevalent influence over that so um, so yeah so time about said a fusion of Carlos Castaneda and Tolkien and I'll just read the blurb from the back and it says sent on a mission deep into the forests of pagan Anglo-Saxon England Watt Brand a Christian scribe suddenly finds his beliefs shaken to their core with Wolf a wizard as his guide Watt is instructed in the magical law of plants runes fate that's weird and life force to finally journey to the spirit world on a quest to encounter the true nature of his old, own soul. And it's interesting because this edition has um, an introduction by Bates, who um, teaches history and psychology, I believe. He wrote a book called The Real Middle Earth, but how Dark Ages England was, you know, the inspiration for Middle Earth in Tolkien's books. And um, it is it is a fantasy novel. It's very, very mystical. It's published by Hay House, who don't usually do fiction. And in the introduction, the new introduction, Bates says, you know, this is not fiction. It's based on what he's read in various Anglo-Saxon books. And, but it is fiction. It's got a narrative. It's got a story. But you do learn an awful lot about um, Anglo-Saxon sort of um, pagan, Celtic sort of mythology really and, and magical practices and it's really interesting so there are the odd sort of bits of friction and terror but it's about comparative religion and I think that's one place sort of where folk horror is really interesting you know it looks in comparative religion in different ways you know in everything from the Wicker Man to um, you know even a book like Lords of Chaos the black metal book which is really interesting in comparative religion I think amongst other things so that's worth looking out for so while this and the whole stock aren't sort of sword and sorcery really they were marketed as fantasy novels in the 80s when fantasy had a sort of broader feel than it does now where everything is like endless trilogies you could get away with something a bit different in the 80s and because the fantasy boom had only just been going about five, six years and, and publishing was a lot less commercial then and it was more freewheeling. So um, this is worth looking out for. If you're interested in um, sort of, you know, um, British heathen pagan sort of beliefs from the Dark Ages and before, this is really interesting. So I wouldn't say it's folk horror, but it's definitely tangential for, for those of you who is interested in traditional beliefs, I'd really sort of go for it. So I don't really want to say too much more about them now and let you discover yourself. So that's Robert Holdstock and Brian Bates. I'm going to be doing a video soon about Stephen Gregory and his mastery of the avian macabre. And I've also filmed a video recently about Nicholas Royal or the Nicholas Royals, I should say, since there are two of them. And I'm just reading um, again for the second time 
this marvellous book, An English Guide to Bird Watching by Nicholas Royle. That's Nicholas Royle, the author of The Uncanny, the literary critic, and of course, this Nicholas Royle, the literary and horror writer who's a bit younger. Um, confusing stuff. So, I'm going to be doing something about that and Stephen Gregory, which will be of interest to those if you're interested in the broader sort of new gothic, as it was called. It was called the new gothic in the early 90s. I still use it, I think, as a handy term for, you know. British literary horror. So this is Outlaw Bookseller. I'm going to sign out now. It's been great to um, to talk about folk horror with you. There may be some more to come. I hope you've enjoyed the little mini season we've done. And I will move on to the blooper reels now. Maybe, maybe I think perhaps. Bye for now. There's such cardinal disrespect now for quiet and peace and space and it's made difficult by this overpopulated country. I know I'm a boy, I know I keep banging on about these things, but that's the way I am, a <laughs> natural misanthrope. It's one of the reasons why I like the great English catastrophe novel, the idea of a denuded Britain with the population gone. I think that's the psychological appeal of the disaster novel and getting back to nature. Of course, when one goes in search of the uncanny, one has to go, you know, seven o'clock on a Tuesday morning on the middle of the night. It's just sort of half past eleven on a Thursday in January and this is why I virtually never go along canals anymore because they're always packed with people and you're dodging cyclists so people think the countryside is quiet that it'd be easy for sort of folk horror things to go on. Um, you know there's a guy with a chainsaw sort of like the Bathampton Chainsaw Massacre here we are at a borderland. This is a um, pedestrian level crossing. Trains go through here down deeper into Somerset to Bradford and Avon, Trowbridge, Froome. It's a lovely little line actually. I love catching the train down there. Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> I'm just going to go into the churchyard at St Nicholas in um, Bathampton and Walter Sickett, the post-impressionist English painter, is buried here. And one theory, of course, is that he was Jack the Ripper. I'm not sure where Sickett is buried. One day I must find the headstone. As I say, the theory that he was Jack the Ripper. Patricia Cornwall, the queen of forensic crime fiction, had this theory and she bought one of his paintings and shredded it to look for forensic evidence, which is just shocking because he was a really good painter. And he did this series of paintings called The Camden Town Murders, which led people to think that he might be involved. And there's all sorts of elaborate conspiracy theories which probably don't hang together. I'm not convinced of that myself. I get a feeling we'll never ever know. I wore these shades today because they remind me of the ones that Vincent Price wears in The Tomb of Ligeia, the only Corman Poe that's filmed with lots of exteriors and filmed in England. I can't think of the name of the character he plays, but he pretty much puts me on that mind. But he's a lot more cadaverous than me. Um, but you know, the velvet voice. And you know, I do think they're overrated, the Corman Poe's, but they have a nice feel about them. But sometimes they are quite dull, it has to be said. And you see them as a kid, you think, wow, and then later on, they don't really match up to the hammers at all, it has to be said.